Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Oops. Turn the audio on. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with a regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Nary Warren South. Broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and by the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV Digital Channel 1 and also via my YouTube stream type in VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine and look for the live indicator and hopefully uh, the stream will hold in for uh, the next hour or so <clears throat> okay, uh, on the 22nd of, uh, of March, we wish everybody a very pleasant a good evening and hope everybody has a good weekend. We'll see you all next week. No, we also have an email address, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com for any signal reports and the like, uh, which I'm uh, watching the inbox as I speak to a, on a laptop next to me here and uh, also the Discord channel, the uh, Astronomy Chat Room on Discord. And a very pleasant good evening to Robert, VK3GOD, is uh, there on Discord. Um, and I think, uh, I think Astrophys is there, Mr. Astrophys himself is there. Um, yeah. And still, VK3 SPX has just chimed in. So, uh, yes, all come up on the chat window and have a chat and t just totally ignore me. Um, <laughs> anyway, trust everybody is okay. And uh, hope everybody is feeling fine. I think I've already said that. Um, all right, let's get into the usual spiel. I think everybody, I think everything's okay. I apologize for the, uh, the audio on YouTube last week. Uh, I had too much bass in fact I'm doing it again let me just knock that back um, yeah almost almost did it again oh uh, yeah I wind up the bass EQ for um, the WIA broadcast um, through the big meters which is um, just behind me in this shot here the uh, the telefunken thing <laughs> But um, anyways, uh, it's a foggy picture, isn't it? It's like the, the lens is dirty or something. Um, well, it's not professional, so I'll go back to my other camera and run the thumb across the other one and see if that's done any good to it. No, not really. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll just have to put up with that if I switch between that camera. Um, all right, so uh, yes, so like I say, you can view things on YouTube. Unfortunately, there's the uh, 20 minute delay, 20 second delay, might as well be 20 minutes uh, on uh, on YouTube, but that's fine. Uh, you can either stick to st and stay and watch uh, YouTube and not worry about 80 meter feed, um, or um, watch the Melbourne television repeater. I haven't checked the BATC feed, normally the repeater has a, a link to the British Amateur Television Club video stream. So I'm not really sure if that's happening or not. But uh, I can certainly see myself coming off the repeater on the big screen just above me here on the wall. The Astronomical Society of Victoria founded in 1922 and has well over 1,600 members scattered throughout Victoria and uh, Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to share this knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month. And... Uh, yes, 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 I'm looking all that. And uh, meetings start at 8pm. Mullia Hall, Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive, and uh, not too far from the Shrine Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, 
Dallas Brooks Drive and surrounding streets, like I said just a moment ago. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. The uh, meetings like to finish by 10 o'clock on the noggin, so uh, only a couple of hours. The me monthly meetings are now being streamed on YouTube, on um, the ASV's YouTube channel, and also uh, on Facebook. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. <coughs> Copies of the ASV's magazine Crux, containing articles, news, observing notes and the like, are, are available once joined, including the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Uh, access, is to, access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and uh, after monthly meetings, per weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan to members trying to, uh, some members can try before they buy. Uh, members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, um, the other two with appropriate training, which range from 300 to 1000 millimeter in size. Uh, also located on the site is an 8.5 steerable radio telescope, which members can be involved with through the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes, optical ones at least. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same thing. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. There are some 20 sections. Other areas of those interests that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, uh, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies, research and astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website at www.asv.org.au. There's also, if once you become a member, uh, every uh, other week or so, there are an email publication that gets released called Crux Extra, and that usually is uh, keeping members uh, up to date about things that are coming up. Uh, ASV will conform to all government health directives. Uh, ASV may be required to cancel, postpone events due to circumstances like fire, bands and things of that nature. If you wish to write a letter to the ASV, the address is the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. You can become a member of the ASV easy peasy. It's uh, all via the website. Just click on the membership uh, uh, symbol, word, you know, on the main page and uh, it will take you through all that. It can be done by PayPal, so all easy. Um, okay, already 10 past the hour. G'day Martin, VK7JAH has joined the chat window room. Uh, Stephen has sent me an email, let me check this. I, I actually, now, that come to think of it, I was meant to send a cheerio last week. Now, chances are the fellow was probably not listening this week. But um, I've got to use which mouse? I haven't got the mouse here with me. Oh, okay. That's a nuisance factor. I actually have to get out of the chair to get the mouse for this laptop. Stand by while I move off screen. <coughs> right. Coming back to the chair. Oh with the wireless mouse 
And if I just go back to last week, uh, it's the next one before that, is it? No, um, let me go back to there. Stephen says, hi Clint, 5 and 9 plus 30 as usual here in Barring Up. Uh, but in Craig, VK3KG, sent me an email. G'day Craig. In Cape, Cape Fear. <laughs> uh, finding your email, Wayne. Oh, go away. I just want to send this cheerio. Um, oh yeah, there we go. He didn't, he didn't mention his name though. Anyway, a shout out to VK3 OP, Oscar Papa. So if you are listening tonight, VK3 OP, a very pleasant good evening to you. And I uh, hope you all enjoy tonight's session. So there I am, just making sure I did that tonight for what it is worth. And... Uh, Moving my, where am I here? Just making sure I am. Oh yes, I see. I've split the screen up between Discord and my inbox, so I can make sure I keep track of that. Alrighty then. Okay, that's been done. So now uh, we've got a few little things tonight, including, believe it or not, we have a segment from our space weather woman, Tamitha Scove. Um, she's finally produced a, um, a video report, solar report that is kind of still current. It's uh, it's more uh, for this last week, for this week this this gone, but it does uh, cover today, for what it's worth. <laughs> so, but we haven't seen Timothy since last year. Um, I mean, she's been releasing reports, but they they haven't exactly corresponded to. Uh, uh, to this time of the week, and they've been otherwise they've been out of date. So uh, this this report gives me a chance to uh, uh, to uh, put her up, and uh, at least it'll it, she'll uh, give us a report on what's been happening this week, and uh, um, the kind of current circumstances with our sun. And uh, I've got a few things uh, on that a little bit later on too. Exactly, actually. Uh, all right, let's go to the first first thing I've got here. Oops, wrong mouse. There's two mouses on my pad here, and I was mucking around with the wrong one. Uh, the first article that I'm going to cover tonight, courtesy of astronomy.com, if I can just find it here. All right, there's a couple of little diagrams I'll throw up on the TV. Yes. Are the percentages of dark matter and dark energy stable? Is the question being asked by Charles Martin of the villages in Florida. Dark matter dominated for most of the universe's history, but in the future, the effects of dark energy will increase, it seems. Published 18th of March. I'll just throw up this little pie chart that they've got here. Uh, bring that up. Okay, there's this pie chart that they're going to make reference to. So, uh, the percentages of dark matter and dark energy stable, or is the ratio of dark matter to dark energy to the observable matter changing? All the atoms and radiation in the universe make up less than 5% of its contents, the rest is composed of two invisible uh, entities, dark matter and dark energy. Together they govern the behaviour of the universe. Evidence of dark matter has been accumulating for 50 years. It makes up most of the mass of all galaxies, including the Milky Way, controls the organisation of galaxies on the largest scales and represents 27% of the universe. The visible parts of galaxies are outweighed by dark matter which holds galaxies together 
dark matter exerts gravity but doesn't interact with light. Astronomers still don't know what dark matter is, but they have eliminated many possibilities. It can't be made of black holes or dim stars, free-floating planets, space rocks or dust particles, and that leaves fundamental subatomic planets uh, sorry, that, that leaves fundamental subatomic particles as the only option. In brackets, the alternative is to decide that the law of gravity needs altering, but this is unpalatable to most astronomers. Close brackets. Dark energy is causing the universe to expand at an ever faster rate. It represents 68% of the universe. The discovery of dark energy in the 1990s was a surprise because the expectation in cosmology had been that the gravity of all the matter in the universe, universe would slow down the expansion discovered by Edward Hubble. Think of the universe as having a break, gravity, an accelerator, dark energy, with both being pushed at the same time, current Currently, the accelerator is twice as strong as the brake, so the universe is accelerating. We know far less about dark energy than dark matter, but it seems to be a, a property of space. Physics tells us that space is not nothing. It has the potential to create energy. Albert Einstein formulated a, universe, a version of this gravity theory where the energy in empty space is not diluted as space expands. As more space comes into existence, more space energy appears, causing the universe to expand faster and faster. So the idea that the amount of dark energy grows as the universe expands has been around for a while but we still lack a physical explanation to test this idea. And there's another little diagram here, which I shall bring up. Okay. Uh, so this diagram is on the screen at the moment. The expansion rate of the universe is influenced by competing forces, that of gravity, which slows down expansion, and that of dark matter, which speeds it up. This diagram on screen at the moment shows the expansion rate over the universe's history with sh shallower curves representing faster expansion and steeper curves showing times of slower expansion. A, notably, a notable change in the expansion rate occurred about 7.5 billion years ago when the universe began accelerating. And that's basically what that diagram is showing you there. To finish off the article, uh, are dark matter and dark energy stable and constant? Question mark. Well, since we don't understand their true physical nature, we can't be sure. But astronomers can see if they vary depending on which direction in space they look. This is a test of whether the universe is lopsided or the same wherever, where everywhere. In brackets, the close sorry. In brackets, the physics term for isotropic. Close brackets. It turns out that the amount of energy, sorry, the amount of dark matter surrounding galaxies is the same in every direction, and the strength of dark energy is also the same in every direction. To see whether the influence of dark matter and dark energy has changed over cosmic time, astronomers look deep into space. Distant light is old light, so telescopes act as time machines, probing billions of years into the past. By measuring the red shift and brightness of distant objects, astronomers map out the expansion history of the universe. Dark matter dominated for most of that history since the Big Bang. That's because when the universe was smaller, the gravity exerted by dark matter was stronger, while the force exerted by dark energy has stayed the same. 
Now is the only time in the entire history of the, the universe when the two entities' influences are about equal. In the future, the effects of dark energy will increasingly dominate and the universe will accelerate forever. So, amazing things that is, isn't absolutely amazing stuff. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, official call sign for the ASV. And uh, this broadcast has been <clears throat> going since 1988. Just thought I'd throw that in. Of course, the the episode number, I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> uh, I guess we estimate that, I suppose. Anyway, all right. Uh, next article. Yes, this has got a few tricky words in it, so I'm going to either skip over those or do my bloody best to pronounce them. Courtesy of astronomy.com again. And there's only one image in this, <laughs> which is nothing much to look at, to be honest. Uh, and I won't even try to uh, pronounce that. It's a king, uh, a, an ancient Neo-Assyrian uh, king dating back to 883 to 859 BC. Oh, I don't know if I should read this article. Bear with me, though, peoples. A weird, sometimes bloody ritual kept kings safe during ancient eclipses. I think you know where that's, this is heading. And I'll bring up this little picture here because it just... See, so you're not looking at me all the time. Well, what I'll do is I'll um, insert it and bring up my insert camera. Like this. There we are. That'll do. Okay, okay, Babylons. The, the, the Babylons, more than 2,000 years ago, calculated there were 38 possible eclipses within a period of 18 years. On April 8, millions of Americans will be able to see the magic of a total solar eclipse. That was been and gone. This article was published on March 20, by the way. Oh, no, actually, it's not been gone. It's still coming, isn't it? I'm getting my months mixed up. It's March 20. This was published, but it's still to happen. On April 8, millions of Americans will, will be able to see the magic of a total eclipse. Humans have been alternatively amused, puzzled, bewildered, and sometimes even terrified at the sight of this celestial phenomenon. A range of social and cultural reactions accompanies the observ observation of an eclipse. In ancient Mesopotamia, Meso Mesopotamia, roughly modern Iraq, eclipses were in fact regarded as omens, as signs of things to come. For an eclipse to take place, three celestial bodies must find themselves in a straight line within the uh, ecliptic orbits. And this is called, and I don't know how you pronounce this exactly, Sazagos, Sazagos, uh, meaning yoked or paired. Sazagos, S-U-Z-U-G-O-S, or it's actually spelt S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y, but it's pronounced Sazagos, Sazagos, Sazagos. It's that word. Anyway, <laughs> from our viewpoint on Earth, there are two kinds of eclipses, solar and lunar. In a solar eclipse, the moon passes in between the sun and Earth, which results in blocking our view of the sun. In a lunar eclipse, it is the moon that crosses through the shadow of the Earth. A solar eclipse can completely block our view of the sun, but it is usually a brief event and can be observed only in certain areas of the Earth's surface. What can be viewed as a total eclipse is one's hometown, may just be a partial eclipse a few hundred miles away. By contrast, a lunar eclipse can be viewed throughout an entire hemisphere of the Earth. The half of the surface of the planet that happens to be on the night side 
at the at the time. Eclipses and omens. More than two thousand years ago, the Babylonians were able to calculate that there were 38 possible eclipses within a period of 223 months, that is about 18 years. This period of 223 months is called a Saros cycle by modern astronomers and a sequence of eclipses separated by Saros cycle constitutes a Saros series. S-A-R-O-S, Saros. All the scientists now know that the number of lunar and solar eclipses is not exactly the same in every star or series. One cannot underplay the achievement of Babylonian scholars in understanding the, this astronomical phenomenon. Their realization of this cycle eventually allowed them to predict the occurrence of an eclipse. The level of of astronomical knowledge achieved in ancient Babylonia or southern Mesopotamia cannot be separated from the astrolog astrological tradition that regard eclipses as omens. Astronomy and astrology were then two sides of the same coin. According to Babylonian scholars, eclipses could foretell the death of a king. The conditions of an omen to be considered as such were not simple. For instance, according to a famous astronomical, astronomical work known by the initial words in Mua Anu Niel, uh, when the gods Anu Anil, if Jupiter was visible during the eclipse, the king was safe. Lunar eclipses seem to have been of particular concern for the well-being of survival of the king. In order to preempt, preempt the monarch's fate, a mechanism was devised, which was called the Substitute King Ritual. There are over 30 mentions of this ritual in various letters from Assyria, which was North Mesopotamia, dating to the first millennium BC. Earlier references to a similar ritual have also been found in texts in Hittite, the Indo or Indi European language for which we have the earliest written records dating to a second millennium and Tolia, modern day Turkey. In this ritual a person would be chosen to replace the king. He would be dressed like the king and, and placed on the throne. To avoid confusion with a real coronation, all this would occur alongside the recitation of the negative omen triggered by the observation of the eclipse. The real king would keep a low profile and avoid being seen. If no additional negative portents were observed, the substitute king was put to death. Therefore, fulfilling the prophetic reading of the celestial omen while saving the life of the real king. This ritual would take place when an eclipse was observed or even predicted, something that became possible to do in later periods. The presence of this ritual among the corpus of Hittite texts in the second millennium has led to the assumption that it must have existed already in Mesopotamia <laughs> during the first half of the second millennium BC. The legend, although omens predicting the death of the king are already known for this earlier period, the truth is that the main basis for such an assumption is interesting story preserved only in much later first millennium composition known by modern scholars as the Chronicle of Early Kings. According to this late chronicle, a king of the, of the city of Isban, modern, uh, modern Izan, about 125 miles southeast of Baghdad, Ira Mimiti was replaced by a gardener called Eleni Bani as part of the substitute king ritual. Luckily for this gardener, the real king died eating hot soup, so the gardener remained on the throne and became king for good. 
the fact is that these two kings, Ira Mitai and Elina Benai, <laughs> did exist and reigned successfully in Isbun during the 19th century BC. The story, however, as told in the late chronicle of early kings, bears all the trademarks of a legend. The story was probably devised to explain a dynastic switch in which the royal office passed from one family of lineage to another. Instead of following the usual father and son line of succession, Mesopotamia was not unique in this regard. For instance, a chronicle of early China, known as the Bamboo Annals, refers to a total lunar eclipse that took place in 1059 BC during the reign of the last king of the Shang dynasty. This eclipse was regarded as a sign by a vassal king when of Zhao destiny to challenge his Shang overlord. In the later account contained in the Bamboo Annals, annals, annals <laughs> an eclipse would have triggered the political and military events that marked the transition from the Shang to the Zhao destiny in ancient China. As in the case of Babylonian Chronicle of Early Kings, the Bamboo Annals are a history of early periods compiled at later time. The Bamboo Annals were allegedly found in a tomb about AD 280, but they purport to date to a, re a reign of the King Zhang of Wei, who died in 296 BC. Finally, the complexity of human events is rarely constrained and determined by one single factor. Nevertheless, whether in ancient Mesopotamia or in early China, eclipses and other omens provide contemporary justifications or after-the-fact explanations for an entangled set of variables that decided the specific course of history. Even if they mix astronomy and astrology, or history and legend, humans have been preoccupied with the inescapable and anomaly embodied by an eclipse for as long as they have looked at the sky. I think we did well, cutting through all that. <laughs> You're tuned to VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night broadcast, 10.33. Getting back to uh, an article on astronomy. <laughs> All right. What is the most distant thing we can see? And there's an image here. I shall throw that up on the screen. Not that one, uh, but this one. There it is. Uh, this is a field of distant galaxies captured by the James Webb Space Telescope, just in case you didn't know that. <coughs> this was published yesterday, <laughs> courtesy of space.com. To the unaided uh, human eye, the night sky is resplendent, resplendent, with over 9,000 individual points of light, but the perspective covers only a bare fraction of the universe. To the unaided human eye, the night sky, I've just read all that, uh, but the perspective covers only a bare fraction of the universe. Yes, they've written that twice. The nearest visible star system is Alpha Centauri, which is about 4.25 light years away. The closest star in this three star system is Proxima Centauri. But because it's a red dwarf, it's too dim to be seen without a telescope. The farthest star that's visible to the naked eye is V72, v, sorry, V762 CAS. 
a variable star sitting at a whopping 16,000 light years away. Although it is likely 100,000 times more luminous than the sun, that incredible distance means it hovers right on the edge of typical human night, human night vision in ideal conditions. Is there anything beyond the universe? Question mark. All of the stars we can see without a telescope are much more massive than the sun. Stars like the sun and smaller are too dim to overcome the light years of distance between them and us, rendering them invisible. Without the volume contained by the distance of V762 CAS, there are about 9,000 variable stars, or sorry, visible stars, and over a million invisible ones. But while V762 CAS, CAS is the most distant star we can see with the naked eye, it's not the farthest thing we can see without a telescope. That honour goes to the Andromeda Galaxy, containing upward of a trillion stars. It appears to us as a fuzzy patch about the size of an outstretched fist. When you look at Andromeda, you're receiving light that first begun or began its journey over 2.5 million years ago. Some flashes and explosions soar to incredible levels of brightness, making them temporarily visible, even at extreme distances. For example, in 2008, the gamma ray burst GRB 080319b was visible to the naked eye for about 30 seconds, despite going off over 7.5 billion light years away. That means that when the light of this gamma ray burst first began its journey, our solar system hadn't even formed yet. When Galileo perfected the astronomical telescope in early, 19, in early 1600s, the universe opened up before us. Telescopes allow us to see dimmer objects because they can collect more light and more distant objects because they also magnify images. Still, even with our most advanced ground and space-based telescopes and most comprehensive surveys, we, we have managed to map less than 3% of all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy and less than 1% of the galaxies in the observable universe. The most distant galaxies are still inaccessible to us. They are simply too dim and too small for us to detect. And there's another image here I shall bring up. Uh, there it is. Okay. So this particular image, it's on the screen right now. It really looks good on the big screen here. The James Webb Space Telescope, NICAM, NIRCAM, Near Infrared Camera Instrument, reveals a 50 light year wide portion of the Milky Way dense center. An estimated 500,000 stars shine in this image of the, Sag of the Sagittarius C region, uh, along with some as yet unidentified features in this image above in the screen, on screen. <laughs> but nature has given us a little trick that we can use to occasionally push farther into the cosmos. When light from a distant star or galaxy passes through a massive cluster, the gravity of that cluster can magnify the image, in some cases by 10,000 times or more. It's though this trick of gravitational lensing that astronomers could detect the most distant known single star named Arendel, yes, the Lord of the Rings reference, which comes from the Anglo-Saxon myth of the morning star which currently sits over 28 billion light years away. That star arrived on the cosmic scene a mere 900 million years after the Big Bang, putting it within reach of the first generation of stars to appear in the universe. Employing a similar gravitational lensing technique, astronomers used the James Webb Space Telescope to precisely measure the distance of, of JADES GSZ13-0, the most distant known galaxy. It is currently found over 33.6 billion light years away 
and formed when our universe was a mere 400 million years old. Beyond that, we can still see cosmic objects, but to do so, uh, we have to switch to other wavelengths of light. In the microwave, we are surrounded by a glow of the cosmic microwave background, whose light was generated when the universe was 380,000 light uh, years ago, no light, 380,000 years old, and transitioned from a plasma to a neutral gas. That light has soaked the cosmos since then and sits near, near the, at the edge of the observable universe. Astronomers suspect there are other signals coming from de even deeper in the past. For example, exotic processes in the earliest moments of the Big Bang generated a flood of ghostly particles known as neutrinos, and the hunt is on for this relic population. Even more exotic processes within the first second of the Big Bang uh, likely swamped the cosmos in a gravitational waves. Proposed missions like the Big Bang Observer might catch the faint traces of this leftover signal. If detected, it would be by far the most distant thing we could have ever possibly seen or see. <coughs> Bring up the camera. That's courtesy of space.com. What is the most distant thing we can see? Okay. All right. Before next, before we go into Tamitha's solar report, this is something I thought I might just fill in the gap on sciencealert.com. Scientists say they've found the best place to spot a UFO in the US. I could make it funny, but I'll try not to. And there's a picture here. When I first read this title, I thought they were actually referring to they have actually found, finally have found this UFO that's been in Area 51 for so many years. That's not, that's not exactly what the article is about. Um, all right, bring up this. Yeah, there it is. There's a flying saucer. <laughs> <clears throat> if you want to see, actually, what prompted me to actually read read this article out, and it's only a few words. Um, I was at Bunnings tonight, picking up a 2.4 meter long spirit level for my deck for the dome. <clears throat> Anyway, whilst whilst I was in the car park, <laughs> there was a, a car just opposite me that's registration plate was, um, I think it was something like the UFO man, or just UFO man, and I thought, oh yeah, okay. Anyway, if you want to see identified flying objects in the skies across the US, head west. Researchers from the University of Utah wanted to look into how local environmental factors affect sightings of these UFOs. Now officially described as Identified Anomalous Phenomena, or UAPS, <laughs> UAPS. The term refers to anything seen in the sky which cannot or which can't readily be attributed to natural phenomena or openly described technology. The analysis of reports reported, sorry, the analysis of reports recorded in the past couple of decades and measures of features such as sky cover, light con lighting conditions revealed most hotspots can be found largely in less brightly lit, more open states like Washington, Nevada and New Mexico. And there's a picture here of the United States, um, which shows the hotspots, so to speak. Yeah. The West has a historical relationship to UAP, Area 51, for instance, in Nevada, Roswell, in New Mexico. And here in Utah, we have Skinwater Ranch 
in the Utinia Basin, in the Utina Basin, and the military activity in the U.S. Army Dugway Proving Ground. Plus, there's a robust outdoor community that recreates in public lands year-round. People are out and looking skyward, perhaps walking away with a better understanding of astronomy than anything else. Anyway, that's just a comment that I threw in then. <laughs> anyway, um, two conditions were assessed for each, for each sighting. Sky view potential taking into account cloud cover and light pollution and the potential for objects to be present in the sky based on how many airports and military bases are nearby. The idea is that if you have a chance to see something, then it's more likely that you're going to see unexplained phenomena in the sky. Fewer sightings were logged in the out southwest of the US and across the central plains of the country, while credible relationships were spotted between clusters of sightings and commercial military air traffic. The thinking is that people appear to be spotting common technology under conditions that makes it harder to see them for what they are really are. Being able to flag when that is likely to happen will help in identifying anomalies that need investigating whether they are whether they're threats to national security unusual atmospheric phenomena or yes even sp spacefaring tourists from spacex rockets to consumed drone consumer drones there's more tech in the sky than ever before Having data on what factors influence sightings and where they're most likely to happen is going to be useful in figuring out exactly what's being reported. There are many factors that can contribute to the report of anomalous objects, says geographer Simon Brewer from the University of Utah. He says, by examining the spatial distribution of reports and how they related to the local environment, we hope to provide some geographical context that may help to resolve or understand reports of, by both the public and in military settings. And the research has been published in Scientific Reports. So I just thought I'd uh, throw that one in. The Americans love a good UFO story. Uh, they have a thing for it. And... Uh, half the time I think they're dreaming so you are tuned to ASV Radio VK3 EKH the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria we shall now present Tamitha Scove with her solar report let me just queue up her video and if all is good we shall be able to cross to her in just a second when I press this button Stand by. Hopefully, the levels will be too not too much. Activity picks up with multiple solar storms. One of them is Earth directed, and some returning big flare players rotate back into Earth view. Those stories and more in the news this week. Ever dream of a career at the forefront of space and technology? Join us for the course, Operational Space Weather Fundamentals, in the historic heart of La Quila, Italy. This unique week-long program delivers cutting-edge space science with real-world applications for our modern age. Get hands-on laboratory training and make predictions alongside world-renowned experts. Network with future leaders while you gain state-of-the-art expertise that sets you apart and ready to address the needs of the rapidly emerging space sector. Midweek, take an adventurous tour to several medieval villages on the outskirts of L'Aquila. Refresh yourself with breathtaking landscapes and architectural wonders. Feel inspired for the future as you explore this region's rich past. Discover the impact of space weather on our world and become the pioneers of tomorrow. Sign up for Operational Space Weather Fundamentals today. Your journey begins now. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops.
Space weather this week kicks up an activity in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, you can see we're saying goodbye to region 3599, but not before this whole cluster of active regions really begins to up the ante when it comes to activity. We'll talk more about that in a second. Meanwhile, we've been paying attention to a lot of these filaments. In fact, this one here in the north, it launches whoosh like that. This is a solar storm, as we can tell from the chronographs, that's going to go mainly northward of Earth. We're probably not going to see much, if any, effects from that solar storm so we're not worried about it but look back at the west limb watch this in fact you can see this kind of evacuate like whoosh you see that that was hard to see but in coronagraphs oh my goodness look at this massive solar storm launch this is actually such a large solar storm it was probably launched from region 3599 along with a big solar flare but we didn't see the flare because it's on the sun's far side but it was so big that it actually launched a radiation storm and we've been dealing with that over the last couple days in fact we actually even had a second solar storm launch there shortly after the first one so this is going to be a very interesting set of regions to watch as they rotate to the sun's far side and whether or not they survive their far side passage. Meanwhile, if you look center disk, on the 16th we had a little poof right there. That was a little mini solar storm launch. We might feel the effects of that, but it's probably not going to be all that much. Then after that, on the 17th, you're seeing uh, or on the 16th, rather, you're seeing a big so uh, solar flare. This was an M 3.5 flare, you can see here in the, the DRAP model, you can see the radiation storm that's ongoing. That was from the stuff that happened on the West Limb, but watch for this big radio blackout. This was an R1 level radio blackout from this region. So this was a flare, a, a solar flare that was occurring from a region that isn't even in Earth view yet. So likely this is a big X flare player because that solar flare would have been a lot bigger had it not been for it being occulted like that. So we do have a lot of activity. You can continue to see more activity here and more big flares are going to be on their way. Meanwhile, when we actually take a look at some region down in here, we're going to, I'm going to replay that. Look at this filament. Watch this. This is on the 17th. Whoosh! Did you see that? That's a big solar storm launch. And finally, we finally get an Earth-directed solar storm out of all of these different launches that are going on all over the place. As we take a look in coronagraphs, you can start to see the halo kind of building here. You also will see a little bit of a halo right here as well. Let me play that. You see that? You can see this big ring that kind of goes almost all the way around the sun. It's kind of hard to see the part on the... Uh, on the west side or the east side there. Let me back it up just a little bit, but you can see it as I whip it back and forth right there. See that? That was actually uh, uh, indicating that we do have a solar storm that is going to be Earth directed. I'll talk more about the model runs here in a minute, but we're going to definitely be having some fun from that. What's called what we're calling the St. Paddy's Day uh, solar storm launch. Now, meanwhile, as we take a look at our far sided sun, well, this is because we can no longer use uh, stereo AIA imagery or stereo imagery because stereo is looking at the same side of the sun we are. We have to resort to looking at AIA and HMI imagery of about two weeks ago to kind of get an idea of what is lurking on the sun's far side. And as we do that, of course, region 3590, that is the bad boy. That was a big X flare player the last time it was in Earth view. In fact, that has now rotated. It's, it's rotating into Earth view now as region 3614. But it is not the only one. We also have this big long line of active regions and several of them were quite active uh, the last time around. In fact, as we take a look at our JSOC HMI helioseismology far-sided viewer, this region in gray is the front side of the sun. Everything in yellow or gold is in the far side and so you can see region 3590 as it was rotating to the sun's far side kind of surviving its far side passage but we also had region 3592 98 and 95 these regions also look like they're surviving their far side passage you can see the dark regions coming up here and and then on top of that we do have this new region right here this region is the one that actually gave us that big m flare uh, the m 3.5 flare you don't even see that here that's somewhere down in this area. In fact, as I keep pushing this forward, you barely see it as this re right there. So this is a region that has just recently been growing. This is not a, an old uh, friend, so to speak. And so we will be watching this very carefully because that region is going to be rotating. You know, it was right here is where it was growing. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect to have big solar flares on the menu this week because we are going to be seeing all of these regions rotate back into Earth view and we could have more solar storms on the way.
Now, switching to our moon, we are coming through the second quarter phase on our way to a full moon, with a full moon being on the 25th. So, you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, you're going to have this bright companion. So, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Now, returning to that earthward-directed solar storm, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as I set this solar storm model in motion, you can see that storm being launched mainly to the west of Earth, but also a bit to the south of Earth. Yet there is this little finger-like part that is going to give us a glancing blow, according to the NOAA model, basically about 1600 UTC on the 20th. Now, as we switch to the NASA version of the model, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. As I set this model in motion, you can see again, we've got that solar storm being launched again to the west and to the south. But this time, it looks like it's going to be a bit more of a, a not, you know, flanking blow. It's not going to be a glancing blow. It's going, we're going to get a little bit more of a direct impact. In fact, as we take a look at the impact footprint, you do see Earth is right in it. So it could be a decent hit for aurora photographers. We could get a chance for some aurora down to mid latitudes for a short bit, likely about um, mid-afternoon on the 20th. Of course, if the storm arrives late, it's going to be even weaker than that. But aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you should definitely get a show. And aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, it might be worth a look. And so as we switch to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over this coming week, we are going to be expecting to have a storm watch starting around the 19th. And this is because we, just in case that solar storm ends up being a little bit fast, we're going to be watching for it. Plus, we have a little bit from those tiny little solar storm that launched just a day before. So we could get a little bit of activity. Uh, NOAA is expecting active to minor storm conditions on the 20th and about 50% chance of a major storm at high latitudes and this could easily last in through the 21st before things settle down so roar photographers if you're at high latitudes you definitely should be going out for a look now at mid latitudes the story is not quite the same we're still going to be on a storm watch on the 19th and this is mainly because we do have that little mini solar storm that's coming ahead of this bigger storm and we could see about 25 percent chance of uh, active conditions on the 19th but likely the active conditions will hit us on the 20th and into the 21st we might even get a small chance for a minor storm at mid latitude so our war photographers if you're at mid latitudes probably late on the 20th or into the 21st is going to be the best time to to go out and take a look uh, because there could be a chance for aurora reaching you eh, a little bit sporadically and now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. Well, we are dealing with a uh, solar flux that's climbing a little bit right now. We're sitting in the 150s and we're going to be climbing into the 160s, possibly by into the 170s by late week as all of these new active regions rotate into Earth view. We are sitting at minor noise on the radio bands right now and this is because mainly because of the new regions that are rotating into Earth view. We know is giving us about a 30% chance of an R1 to R2 level radio blackout. Those are M class flares and even about a 5% chance of X class flares at the R3 level radio blackout and these conditions will likely uh, continue to rise as we get through midweek. We could see uh, moderate noise on the bands by that time with, with uh, more of these active regions rotating into Earth view. I'm expecting that uh, risk for radio blackouts will climb to about maybe 40 or even 50%. It's really hard to tell. And of course, the risk for X-class flares may also rise as we move later into the week because we do have those big regions and they have been flaring on the sun's far side. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlooks over the coming week, we are dealing with enhanced radiation storm conditions. In fact, right now we're sitting at the D2 minor range, and this is at flight level 360. And this was due to that S1 level radiation storm that was launched back on the 15th. Luckily, things are beginning to settle down now. We're only at elevated levels. We're below the S1 radiation storm level now. And by about Wednesday, we should be sitting back at the D1 normal range, and that's the S0 
sterile, quiet range for everyone else. Luckily, we only have about a 5 to 10% chance of additional radiation storms at the S1 to S2 level, and that's likely going to continue throughout this week. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers. Stay vigilant this week because we do have a little bit of uh, enhanced radiation conditions right now, but things should settle down pretty, pretty well. But next week, expect these risks to rise. So the space weather this week is getting very exciting. We have an Earth-directed solar storm that could hit us right around the 20th. Now, it's not a direct hit, but Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. And Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, around the 20th to the 21st, it might be worth a look. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, things have been pretty quiet over the past week, but it looks like things are picking up in terms of uh, radio blackouts because we have some new regions rotating into earth view in fact one of them is a returning region that we know is an x flare player and it looks like we have at least one more as well so these regions are going to be causing a lot more noise on the bands but we're also going to raise that solar flux up a bit so you're just going to have to deal with a bit more noise as well as some radio blackouts on earth's day side but propagation should remain in the good range and now you gps users well you know we're going to have some issues on earth's night side once that solar storm storm hits. So if you have to be flying anywhere around Aurora, stay vigilant and make sure you calibrate your magnetometers often. But on the Earth's day side, it shouldn't be too bad this week. But as the week continues and we get more of those big uh, flare players rotating into Earth view, stay vigilant because radio blackouts could definitely cause some issues. I'm Tam of the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Okay, thank you, Timothy. Bring up more levels and uh, look, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, I think we're all there. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, our space with the one. So uh, that report basically brings us up to today. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, uh, always good to uh, catch up with her reports. Uh, okay, well, we'll just go straight into spaceweather.com from uh, that site's point of view. Uh, this is the current disk of the sun. And um, <clears throat> the solar wind is currently at 356 kilometers per second at a density of 6.96 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, and there is a disk of the sun with about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sunspots on it. Current sunspot number is 141. The radio sun is at 197 solar flux units, measured at a at 10.7 centimeters. And I might just throw up the latest chart for the solar cycle. This is where we are at at the moment for those watching the screen so uh, that the two the two charts on the screen at the moment reflect both sunspot number and uh, the uh, uh, solar flux uh, indicator as well so um, <coughs> uh, so that's the current uh, charting for our solar cycle so we're still still to reach the maximum still to reach the peak for solar cycle 25 uh, and it's still uh, going by the trend line there. It's looking very exciting. There's still lots of uh, flaring going on. So uh, we're in for some good times here on the shortwave bands. Uh, okay, the coronial uh, hole. Uh, there is uh, a picture of this um, that I've got as well. Uh, where is it? There it is. I'm using vMix here, so it's a lot of finger clicking going on. Um, okay, so that's the current uh, coronial hole um, facing the sun, uh, solar so facing earth, earth, earthbound. The solar wind flowing from this southern cor coronial hole should reach Earth between March 25 and 26. Um, there is a, a CME sparks geomagnetic storm. A CME hit Earth's magnetic field on March 21. 
uh, sparking a nine hour long geomagnetic storm, G1 class. The longevity of the storm was caused by two broad regions of the south pointing magnetism in the CME's wake. And as Earth passed through these regions, cracks opened in the Earth's magnetic field. Solar wind poured in to, to uh, extend the storm. Uh, we are still waiting for pictures of resulting equinox auroras. Uh, there's also another image here, uh, which I'll, I think I've brought across. Yes, there it is. Um, okay, and uh, what the article here is in space with the Tacom, it says a scattered, shattered sunspot. AR3615 isn't like most other sunspots. It looks like it has been stepped on and shattered. Uh, earlier today, um, a fellow in France photographed the sunspot's 40 plus cores. Uh, and inserted a picture of the Earth for scale, uh, which you can. Oh, well, my uh, my ro revolving banner there is interfering with that, but there it is. That's the Earth uh, and those sunspots in relation to the size of the Earth. Uh, okay, um, only one or two of the sunspots' primary uh, cause close in size to earth the others are about the size of moons or continents or scattered like dice uh, over an area of some 200,000 kilo kilo kilometers wide the unusual complexity of AR3615 is a sign of potential danger uh, magnetic poles sprouting from all these cores are crowded opposite polarities pressed together could reconnect explosively to produce a strong solar flare Indeed, uh, it would not be a sun surprise if AR3615 produced an X-class flare um, before the coming weekend is over. So interesting things are afoot. Uh, the, uh, also, I mentioned the KP index, planetary index. Uh, currently, KP is equal to 3, which is considered quiet. But over the next 24-hour max, the KP is 5, and that is actually considered at storm conditions. And I actually have a graph here too, um, which shows what this is dealing with. Um, let me go to this planetary K index, how it's been progressing over this last day or so. Uh, the K index and by extension the planetary K index are used to characterize the magnitude of geomagnetic storms. KP is an excellent indicator of disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field and is used by Space Weather Prediction Center to decide whether geomagnetic alerts and warnings need to be issued for users who are affected by these disturbances. Uh, the principal users affected by geomagnetic storms are the electrical power grid, spacecraft operations, user of radio signals, which I guess is us, and uh, that reflect off or pass through the ionosphere and observers of aurora. So yes, uh, I thought that might uh, just clarify a little bit in that uh, reference. Uh, okay, uh, the other diagrams here, um, going back to, to finish off space weather, oh, the aurora, um, the current uh, aurora borealis, uh, oh, sorry, australis, <laughs> I always get those mixed up, uh, is looking like this as I speak. So there's only just a minor glow uh, over Antarctica, uh, nothing to write home about, as I so often say. But um, maybe that'll change in the next 24 hours. We'll keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, uh, I think that's about it for spaceweather.com. Uh, the current uh, hazardous asteroid scenario is that as of March 22, uh, 2024 there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids there it is 
at nine past the hour. I didn't think I'd go there, but there it is. All right. Thank you for listening, folks. Um, to everybody there on the chat room, uh, Cassiopeia, uh, Robert, the K3GOD, uh, our resident uh, Mount Burnett uh, friend, VK3KDM David, Martin, VK7JH, and I think there's a few others that might have been there on the chat room, uh, Steve, and and, uh, and yes, that's about it. All right. And the only email that I got tonight was from Steve, VK3SBX. All right, that's covering that side of it. So let's now open up the frequency and see if there's any stations wishing to check in tonight's session. This is VK3 EKH listing on 3541 kilohertz. Well, I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, there seems to be a station that's uh, transmitting my uh, delayed uh, signal off, probably off the repeater by the sounds of it.